The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's presentation titled Tips for Researchers, Strengthening Research that Benefits Native Youth. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how to participate in today's web event. Right now, we are looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on their screen, and a control panel on the right. Within that control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's take a look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close your control panel. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel to not auto-hide when inactive if you prefer to keep it always open. The audio pane provides audio information. If the organized, we have not, um, we have muted all of our participants for the duration of the webinar in order to avoid any background interference and noise, but at the end we will ask for you to raise your hand, as we'll discuss shortly here, um, for the discussion in the Q&A towards the end. Um, the audio, to click audio setup to select your computer speaker or headset devices. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone and select by using telephone and the dial-in information will be displayed, including an audio pin. And if you have any questions of today's presenters, you must enter the audio pin in order to have your line unmuted. During the presentation, we may ask you to answer a question by raising your hand, um, or you know, if you have a question for the presenters, please use that function to the left there to raise your hand, and we will be able to unmute your line during the Q&A session. Okay. At the end of today's session, everyone will receive an email within 24 hours with a link to a survey about today's session, and we will have a follow-up email to all participants with a recording from today's webinar available so that you may review the slides and share this resource accordingly. So thank you again for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Dr. Malia Villegas, who's the director of the NCAI Policy Research Center, to set the stage for today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're very excited to be sharing with you a new resource and to be featuring some of the contributors, some of our great partners um, who have helped to shape this resource. We want to acknowledge the Administration for Native Americans, ANA, within the Department of Health and Human Services for helping to support this work as well as partners such as the National Institutes, uh, sorry, the um, Native, uh, National uh, Indian Health Board, excuse me, got my acronyms confused there, NIHB, who helped to host a initial session where these conversations uh, really began about how to um, think about tips for researchers working in tribal and Native um, uh, youth contexts. So our project with ANA is called uh, Making Visible, Making Valuable, trying to center the voices of Native youth and develop more uh, youth-centered research. And as part of that work, we heard pretty quickly that we needed better guidelines and guidance and information for researchers and research partners uh, who were interested in developing appropriate and meaningful research. And so that's the spirit within which we're uh, very excited to share this webinar with you. So this slide, uh, introducing tips for researchers, just gives a little bit of some uh, broad brush strokes about we, what we hope this tool um, and resources might provide. On the first front, it is really designed um, for research partners. It's a partnership tool for those who are involved in stewarding research in Native youth contexts. It is developed in collaboration with scholars, uh, who you'll hear from today, who have a demonstrated commitment and, and very deep experience working in Native youth and family context. So we're very excited to have them join us and share some of their insights today. Everything that we do at NCI is designed as a work in progress. 
a discussion tool, a jumping off point for these community conversations about how to strengthen Native youth research. So our hopes around how you might consider using this tool is not by any means a stepwise, step-by-step process of how to, but more um, this conversation starter about some of these broad themes that we'll share with you today and having really local, contextually based, place-based conversations about how some of these elements um, play out and work in the communities that you're partnered with. So that's the hope um, and what we'll share with you today. Next slide, please. Some of the uh, overview of the tool, um, the way that we're structuring the webinar is very much like the, um, the product that we'll be releasing at our um, annual convention here in a couple of weeks in Phoenix. But the sections that we um, have are really how do we begin to understand Native youth. We provide some basic demographics. Um, we know that Native youth make up about 42% of our total American Indian Alaska Native uh, population, where youth under the age of 25 make up 34% of the total U.S. population. So we are a very young community, and that's a big part of why we want to provide more direct resources here and give some insights. But Native youth uh, are as varied as our, our tribal nations, so it's very important to really think about how context and place and history and local experience matter um, to their realities and their experiences. Um, the other five sections here uh, are really led by our uh, scholar partners. Um, the first we'll be hearing about is um, how critical and some insights about how to center youth voices. That's really the starting point for this conversation, um, how to make sure that youth are at the center of the work that we're developing for their benefit. Second set of uh, resources and insights are about um, engaging tribal communities. We know that youth are part of these um, complex systems, families, uh, community contexts. How do we appropriately engage uh, those um, communities and networks that they're a part of? Then we'll turn to the power of place-based and small-scale inquiry. How do we really design um, our work in ways that can build and understand and, and access some of the nuanced um, context pieces that are really critical. And then we'll shift to kind of a, um, a conversation about looking at expanding to urban and national settings. Um, so really thinking about the um, other kinds of contexts, uh, certainly tribal and reservation based, but many of our youth and their families are in uh, urban spaces and, and national Settings, so needing to think about how that matters to tips for researchers. And then we'll finish up with a discussion about some ethical considerations that also touch on the nature of our families, our family composition, and uh, hint at some of the legal aspects that are really critical. So that's a little bit of a flow. Um, we'd really love to have a discussion at the end of all of this about um, you know, whether and how you might see using this tool in your context other um, themes or discussions that are important in your work that you want us to consider including in, in future versions of this uh, tool and resource that way. So I'm going to hand over to our, our first scholar partner, uh, Mr. Greg Tafoya, um, to talk with us about some of his insights and some of what's in the tool about centering youth voice. Greg? Thank you, Malia. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'd first like to thank the NCAI PRC, my fellow colleagues, and thank the youth. I'm pleased to be here with you today to share tips for researchers who are interested in working with Native youth. My name is Greg Tafoya, calling in from Reno, Nevada. I'm originally from Santa Clara Pueblo, located in northern New Mexico, where I'm enrolled, and I'm also Sac and Fox. I'll be providing tips for centering youth voices. Next slide, please. American Indian and Alaska Native youth, or tribal youth, are a treasured group. They link the knowledge of the past with a new vision for the future, while living in the present. Working with tribal youth will never be straightforward. A researcher aiming to meaningfully engage youth in research must make an intentional effort to consider many dynamic contextual factor, factors at play with this temp contemporary population. 
Native youth, Native youth are proof of resilience and survival. They are here in the present because of the sacrifices, creativity, and strength of those who came before us. They are also living visions of our future and will be responsible for sharing our collective memories and history. In the present, this population is unique in that more than ever, they need to negotiate multiple worlds and a multitude of information. Just as a reminder, we are using the definition of youth to be from birth to 24 years of age and depends on how tribes define this stage of life. This could mean the millennial generation and Generation Z, for example. These demographic cohorts are the first tribal populations to grow up in a digital environment. Technology and social media has influenced nearly every aspect of their world, including education, socialization, and access points to information. They see, hear, and process what is said about them, their families, and their culture. They can be online and digital, digital, digitally connected, even if they live in remote frontier lands, as easily as off-reservation youth living in urban settings. They can cross cultural and geographic boundaries much, much more than ever because of technology. Therefore, it's critical that researchers be mindful and reflective of their own values and approach when engage, engaging youth in research. Uh, we're on slide three, by the way. Every aspect of tribal communities or a tribal system can influence tribal health and the well-being of youth. This view is similar to using a so the social logic social ecologic framework to determine key influencing factors to health outcomes. However, a systems view recognizes not only elements such as government, education, family, and peers. It also recognizes dynamic interconnections between elements and system variability in connections that can result in constantly changing relationships to the overall function and purpose of the system. This this perspective asserts that those within the system know solutions to issues. Therefore, centering youth voices in research can be the difference between successful and unsuccessful research projects. Next slide, please. I've worked with tribal youth since 1998 in basic lab and public health research settings, and since 2002 in, as an extreme sports professional. Before that, I was asked to mentor foster kids from other tribes who temporarily, temporarily re resided in my community because they felt like outsiders. And like many listening, I was once a tribal youth myself many, many years ago. I present the following tips for centering youth voice from my own experience. First, the reality of working with tribal youth is that they have diverse identities that encompass values that range from traditional to Western world. They are often very conscious about privacy and issues they find personal to their own experience. Recall your own youth experience. This was true as then as it is now. Only now, privacy can be protected with apps, passwords, and encryption. And youth are very perceptive and suspicious about, youth, about adults approaching them, especially researchers and professionals who are asking questions. With these and many other complexities at play, tribal youth come from such a diversity of cultures that there is no one way of understanding the characteristics they may embody. Identification of these values can only be done through engagement. Second, centering youth voice and experiences allow a researcher to gain insight to what is important to youth. National and state level data sources have gaps that can challenge how a researcher thinks of health topics causing misalignments and tribal perspectives, causing, causing misalignments with tribal perspectives and youth priorities. Third, tribal governance, so sovereignty, and politics are elements of the system. Research for too long has ignored the interconnections of these elements and variability in connections in relation to community well-being, especially youth wellness. The fourth and fifth points are related. A reciprocal relationship between youth and researchers should focus on building capacity. Research should look beyond its 
Thank you so much, Greg. Really appreciate the insights and just the honor and respect with which you always bring uh, to the work with uh, our youth partners. We'll turn now to another scholar partner that we have uh, to talk about engaging tribal communities, Catherine Burnett. Thank you, Catherine. Hello, this is Catherine Burnett. Thank you so much uh, for this honor uh, to present with such um, wonderful colleagues. And I uh, always love the opportunity to do anything with the NCAA. Uh, Policy Research Center. It's a true honor and just uh, respect the role NCAI and the Policy Research Center has continued to play in history and in contemporary times. So just thank you for including me on this um, great opportunity. I'm an assistant professor at Tulane University down in New Orleans and I'm going to speak to you today about engagement with travel communities, particularly those um, that I've worked with in the southeast. And so I've worked with um, some southeastern tribes for the last seven years. And I do speak from a, a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I'm not a native person, and so um, my road may be a little bit different or, or very different um, because of my background um, that I don't share. Uh, 
an Indigenous uh, identity. And so I'm going to incorporate some of that perspective in uh, my positionality as, as a non-Native person working with, with tribal groups, um, going from the assumption that tribally-driven research can lead to more meaningful outcomes that actually benefit tribal youth. And so to start with, I just did want to talk a little bit about you know, what Greg was talking about in terms of being a guest, and that uh, as a researcher, um, the social distance between myself and the communities uh, with whom I work can vary a lot. And one of those ways it varies is, um, can be based on you know, tribal affiliation or, or ethnic um, identity, as well as you know, education, income, gender. And so we all, you know, vary in the social distance to the people with whom we're communicating with, and that's an important thing to remember. And with that, there's also, you know, power differentials. And so I come in with, you know, a certain educational background and, and living from, you know, living in a, in a geographic area that may be familiar or unfamiliar with the people that I'm working with. And so I'm always aware of, you know, what I may represent to the people that I'm working with. Um, and also, just a lot of the work that I do has focused on um, historical oppression and trauma and how that is related to, you know, violence against women and related health disparities. And just like the context of historical oppression and trauma has affected the social reality of people today, it also has affected research and the baseline trust of research um, for a lot of uh, Native communities. And so, there has been a context of harm done through research. Um, sometimes people have you know, used uh, research in a way that hasn't benefited tribal communities um, or has, have misused information um, that was you know, identified for a certain purpose. And so there's a context of real experiences in that you know, if you talk with people today that they can tell you stories about how you know, research hasn't always been done and may not be um, being done in a a sensitive, uh, beneficial way for tribal communities. So, so there's understandable mistrust that, as a researcher, I you know I'm I'm walking into that um, and need to remember that. And so, because of that, uh, one of the things that I found has been important has been to to shift that balance. And there's certain methods that kind of do that automatically, like community-based participatory research. Um, and it's so important to build trust and in, in relationships and to demonstrate you know, a commitment and um, that you want to contribute in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way with the community that you're working with um, to really gain entree into any, any um, community. Um, and so before, as a, as a non-Native person, before I even got to a position of doing research, really, one of the things that I did um, was actually to do research on the research process itself and interview both Native and non-Native researchers who had, you know, multiple years of experience and just ask them, you know, about their experience and what, what they recommended. And so some of the things that um, came out from that initial research of preparation was just creating mutual respect and trust. So having humility that as a, as a non-Native person, my role will never be the same and, and that my role is to contribute and to hopefully highlight the voices of Native youth and, and Native um, ideally researchers to, to do this work as well. Um, and so always knowing that my position is always different um, as a person from outside um, communities. And then also finding the harmony among multiple worldviews and thinking about, you know, indigenous worldviews versus more Western worldviews. Um, and also looking at those power differentials that have been um, uh, placed to each of those, those worldviews. And then just deep commitment and responsibility. And because there has been this context of historical oppression, Everything I do matters, and, and first of all, you know, the, the, pur the purpose is to do no harm, and if I can contribute, how can I contribute in an ethical and, and culturally relevant way? And so everything I do um, is, is very important. I, I think about the implications of that, particularly because of this context of historical oppression. Uh, next slide. And so I don't want to go, there, there, there are, um, from that research that I was talking about, there were kind of some tips that um, the researchers have identified. I'm not going to go through all of these um, in detail, but I did want to provide them. They, they, there are different um, tips that I've included and in, integrated in the research I've done, and I think they've led to some success in that I've been able to work with communities long term. Um, and these are some of the things 
these are some of the reasons I think it's actually been very um, fruitful, affirming, I think, for both myself and hopefully the communities that I work with. But some of those things are listed here in terms of working with insiders, you know, building a reputation, humility, being transparent, getting to know people in the community. You know, I did ethnography where I lived, you know, with the communities and therefore kind of gained familiarity. You can go to the next slide. And then, again, these are just some more of these uh, tips that people may find use useful. You know, if the tribes may be located further away from metropolitan areas, but just being willing to go the distance, enabling self-determination in the research method and the way things kind of go in the research process, using a travel um, perspective and some of these things like focusing on strength and confidentiality, which I know um, other people will be talking about today. Next slide. And then finally, advocating kind of the social justice aspect of doing this kind of work in the context, reciprocating and giving back. So all of the work that I've done, I always make sure to provide compensation in the short term and also, you know, reporting results and actually providing, you know, after gathering information from the tribe, you know, reporting those results, but also actually providing whatever, you know, intervention or, or implications are um, you know, revealed by the research, and so I'll, tell, I'll talk to you a little bit about, you know, what, how that has played out in my research. And then one of the most important things has been fluidity and, and flexibility in the research process to go with the, the flow of the tribe that you're working with and the community partners. You can go ahead and go forward. And so uh, in terms of working with, with youth, uh, I've worked with two separate, you know, southeastern tribes, one that is federally recognized and one that isn't. And so the infrastructure has really varied in each of those tribes. They're about, you know, um, a few hours apart, but very, very different. And so uh, one, that fluidity and flexibility has been so important. And one tribe, there is more infrastructure where there might be like a boys and girls club and those, you know, I have connected with um, partners and that to access youth and, and, and work with youth, whereas the other tribe doesn't have as much uh, uh, formal infrastructure. And so it's been more word of mouth and relationship building, and people then um, will invite me in and to, to work with the youth. So the work that, I, the, the, I, um, the example of the work that I've done um, started with violence against women and uh, girls. And what I found when I talked with women who had experienced violence is that they went to their families for support and that the families made such a difference in whether the women had more positive outcomes or not. And that the violence started in childhood for over 80% of the women I talked to. And so from that, I've, I've been working on a culturally relevant um, risk and protective factors framework using that systemic framework. and. Um, especially focusing on family resilience. And in doing that, um, I've talked with about 400, you know, tribal people from two different tribes and had subsamples of youth, adults, professionals, elders, and, and um, about 30 of each of those, along with focus groups and the whole family interviews. And uh, in that, the youth have identified, you know, risk and protective factors. Um, and you know, that, that process has been very different with the two different tribes. And so it's been really important for me to trust that there are protocols and that the people that I'm working with, you know, will guide me on those protocols and that having patients to, to get to um, the, the information. It's been a very affirming process. Um, it's informed a survey. So we've identified risk and protective factors that people identified through storytelling, which worked really well and people enjoyed that. So using that method worked well. And then um, this informed a survey to look to see whether these risk and protective factors do predict outcomes like mental health and violence. And I just got the results back and I'm finding that they are really um, some strong results, particularly uh, family resilience as being a, a very large protective factor for mental health and, um, and violence related outcomes. So I'm very excited about that. So I, that's all to say that I do think when you're very embedded and working very closely with the community that you know, we were able to create this culturally relevant survey that actually I think yields very um, exciting results and is informing a uh, prevention program that focuses on the whole family um, uh, and promoting resilience while preventing substance use and family violence. And so I know I'm about out of time here, but um, it, you know, it's a long-term process of seven years, but it's really has been so affirming to start, you know, from scratch and really um, then actually contribute in a way that hopefully will benefit um, the communities directly. So thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Catherine, for the insight and, and just the explanation about the, the process. Investing in that relational process is really what is going to strengthen um, the research partnerships and the outcomes. And just to, again, reiterate that uh, there's uh, the, the, the richness of uh, what these scholars have contributed will be coming out in this um, resource that we'll hope to launch in, uh, and share in a, in a couple of weeks at NCI's uh, annual convention, so you can read more there. Now we're going to shift to uh, another scholar partner, Tarji Nyazi Mintz, who's going to share with us uh, her presentation. Tarji? Thank you. Can you hear me OK? We can. Perfect. I'm Tarji Nyazi Mintz. I am the co-director of the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs at the American Indian College Fund. Um, I direct the College Fund's Tribal College and University Early Child Initiative. I'd like to express my thanks to Dr. Villegas uh, and her staff at NCAI Research Center for inviting me to participate on this panel. Next slide. I offer, uh, I offer in this presentation, um, you know, in the dialogue, I, I, I am excited to offer my perspective with the, in, in conversation with the other panelists as we contribute to collective work across a continuum of research about Native youth. Our area that I speak to is early childhood work. Um, so in terms of the research emerging from Native communities and institutions, um, we tend to think about research as needing to uh, contribute to more generalizable knowledge. And everything that I've learned about relevant and purposeful research conducted from within Native communities has taught me that inquiry-driven, context-specific, and small-scale research is a powerful way to begin to lay the foundations, the processes, systems toward sustainable action and change. Next slide. Questions generated from within youth groups, early childhood centers, elementary schools, and informal spaces offer us a valuable opportunity to understand how research and action from within communities leads to significant empowerment and innovation possibilities. Next slide. In the research endeavor, I believe strongly that knowledge from specific communities can become universal knowledge. But first, we must, have not, we must first acknowledge that rooted in the particular values, beliefs, practices, circumstances, tribal communities can reprioritize their needs above all others and can intentionally seek to address their central concerns today, not tomorrow, not in 10 to 5 five to ten years, but today. In the next slide, I'm going to share a case example. At four tribal colleges, um, teams of early childhood educators, parents, and children are engaged in context-specific inquiries. They each ask questions about how to ensure that native language and culture have a foundational space in the learning environment. They seek local knowledge and resources to support their inquiry and as an outcome desire to see immediate results, tangible results such as children speaking and singing in their native language. And that language and singing is connected to developmentally appropriate knowledge about mathematical thinking, seeing, the, seeing and reading the world around them, and most importantly, knowledge connected to ensuring that they are connected to their tribal community and family through strong, caring relationships built upon tribally informed health and wellness. Next slide. The example I want to share comes from or emerges from a question. We want to do research inquiry on early childhood education in a community, and a parent asks, I want to know how to strap my child into a car seat properly. That's my research inquiry. This is a question of interest to an individual parent, though this may not be the research inquiry the researcher expected to pursue. This is a starting place question, a research inquiry driven by the interests and needs of a community member and relevant to the needs of that parent. Starting with the community member's question, 
and pursuing the individual's inquiry of this and the, the individual inquiry of this parent and working with the parent on ways to investigate that question follows an inquiry path to starting from starting place questions to shared place questions. Shared place questions are questions that may be of interest to a larger group of parents and community members which may dig deeper into broader issues raised by the parent's initial question and may connect with the researcher's questions of interest. Therefore, the process of investigating a parent's starting place question, in this example, we refer to the proper way to strap in a child to a car seat. This question can lead to the generation of shared place questions, more general or universal questions of interest, such as, what makes my baby comfortable? How do I keep my baby safe? What kinds of car seats work for different babies? How do I interact with my baby during transitions from one setting to another? What is the quality of connection between my baby and me at different points of the day? And what factors impact the quality of that connection? Next slide. The critical point <clears throat> is to begin the research from the needs of the community and the individual community members. Then we can develop methods and questions that will drive that inquiry. And perhaps as a result, we may uncover findings that impact a broader set of people and communities. To develop these inquiries that matter, researchers have to focus on the questions that are in front of them within the community. And if the focus is on generalizable results or methodologies developed from outside, the researchers will miss the primary work that is needed in communities. Researchers must first legitimize the questions that emerge in the community and investigate these questions with them. These may be linked to larger questions and perhaps innovative methodologies may be utilized to pursue the questions. But in community-based research must, must originate in the questions and the methodologies of the community. Next slide. Many methodologies have become accepted as, leg as being legitimate for implementation within Native communities, and a shorthand has developed to refer to these methodologies. However, the development of a shorthand often washes out the depth and complexity of the methodology. For example, community-based research has been shortened to CBR, and participatory, participatory action research has been shortened to PAR, PAR. When a researcher uses these acronyms or names, there is often a belief that researchers are speaking a common language. However, each of these methods require researchers to be in deep and relevant dialogue with community members prior to and during the, the inquiry process, a dialogue that will make the methodology look different and unique in each setting based on the community's questions, the community's needs, and the way in which the methodology can be implemented to best serve the community's inquiry needs. In fact, these methodologies are best conceptualized as philosophies and approaches, not, take, not steps to be taken. The approach requires the researcher to think of the community needs, not their own, as driving the research. The specific ways in which the methodology is implemented will vary from community to community, from individual inquiry to individual inquiry. Next slide. One way to think about this concept of inquiry is to think of fry bread, a food that is common across Indian country. There are many different recipes for fry bread, different across communities. Fry bread may look and taste different. Flavors that come to the forefront, there are different sizes, puffiness, taste, and texture. And these differences may be based on different traditions, available ingredients, climate and location, how and in what the bread is fried, and philosophies about food. Yet there are commonalities, water, salt, flour. So when we talk about fry bread, we are talking about generally, we're generally talking about a familiar food and a cultural connection, but each of us may be thinking about a different taste, texture, or experience. There's not one way to make fry bread and not one taste for fry bread, and similarly, there is not one way to implement community-based inquiry research or participatory action research. And these methodologies represent philosophies and approaches to research that will be different in different communities and for different inquiries. 
the evidence for successful community research is in relationships researchers developed with the communities. And these relationships develop into questions that can be investigated systematically and that will help immediately address issues important to the community. This can also give individuals and the community a process for investigating in a small scale way their questions as they develop into researchers within their own communities. These are the essential ingredients of purposeful and important research with Native communities. Ultimately, with fry bread, if a community does not see itself in the ingredients, they are not going to want to partake of it. Next slide. What needs to happen in order for researchers from the outside to support and engage in this type of inquiry stance and approach? Be prepared to suspend methodology discussions until you understand the goals of inquiry from the perspective of those the research will inform. Be prepared to suspend the idea that research knowledge you are uncovering and revealing must be generalizable. See the varied processes and the approaches as a generative process that may include protocols that are not talked about outside the community. Avoid dropping the research package of results and findings into communities. Help communities unwrap and discover what is research. Next slide. Researchers bring with them passionate areas of inquiry. However, tribal communities have their own passionate areas of inquiry that may then become buried in the process. I've had the intention to take the inquiry from collective visioning through implementation, through full reflection, and plan to disseminate information together. And finally, consider with the community the policy implications starting at the local level. And my final slide. Please visit the American Indian College Fund's website, particularly our TCU Early Childhood Initiatives, starting with our restorative teachings, Early Childhood Initiative. You see the address on the slide. Also, follow us on Twitter and join our social media discussions using hashtags NativeECE, Restorative Teach, and SLO for Life. Thank you for allowing me to contribute to this dialogue. We are very excited about what tribal colleges and their early learning centers can teach us about the power of place-based, small-scale inquiry. Thank you, Dr. Tarajean. I think if we believe that diversity is excellence and that our research must benefit the youth and families we serve and partner with, we really need to ground it in the realities and the interests and, and priorities that the communities and, and the youth set themselves. So thank you for that great presentation. We're going to turn now to uh, Michelle Sarche, who is another scholar partner, to share with us a bit about her presentation on uh, expanding into urban and national settings. Michelle? Hi, everyone. Um, again, this is Michelle Sarche, and are you on, I'm not seeing the slides live, so um, are you on uh, the title slide with the TRC logo? We are. Okay, great. So I am with the Tribal Early Childhood Research Center at the University of Colorado in the Colorado School of Public Health. And I've had um, the opportunity as a clinical psychologist and tribal member myself to work in um, some aspect of youth research um, for, I don't know, 20 plus years. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit um, about my perspectives on um, youth research in tribal communities. So the next slide that starts with context. So two of the um, areas that, from my perspective, I think there are opportunities for researchers to grow our research-based knowledge of Native youth development are in urban contexts as well as in national or regional um, settings. So much of the current research data on uh, Native youth emanates from studies that have been carried out in partnership with one or a few specific tribal communities. So some of the work that's already been highlighted um, by Dr. Burnett and Dr. Tara Jean Yazzie Mintz um, is really focused on the critical value um, of having those studies that are um, very specifically place-based. And so again, these studies are critical for all of the reasons that they've both outlined. Um, however, 
it is important to take some of these um, best practices that Dr. Burnett outlined and some of that um, community-driven inquiry that um, Dr. Yazimans was talking about and take those same approaches with adaptations to urban, national, and regional contexts. So I'm first going to talk about um, urban context. So um, according to the 2010 census, 71% or the majority of the American Indian Alaska Native population resides off tribal lands. I think um, we all are aware of, of that fact, and the majority of our citizens are in um, uh, urban areas across the country. For example, some of the cities with the largest populations are New York City, Los Angeles, and Phoenix. But cities with the largest percentages of American Indian and Alaska Natives are Anchorage, Tulsa, and Norman, Oklahoma, um, right around the 10 to 12% to of the entire population of those cities is AIAN. And so um, there's very little data. There are data out there um, on the, the health and well-being of urban American Indian populations in general. But in terms of urban youth, um, overall, that, that data is fairly limited. Um, but in terms of native youth, um, there, the data suggests there's unique sources of strength and challenge for native youth in urban contexts. Um, these are intertribal communities and there may be intertribal identities um, espoused by those native youth. There's a lot of mobility between the urban and, um, for example, reservation-based communities. And relative to their non-native urban peers and their native uh, peers living on tribal lands, um, some of the existing data shows that healthcare access may be more limited and that certain health disparities might be greater. And so researchers have the opportunity to partner with tribal communities to uh, better understand the nature and scope of native youth in urban communities, their strengths and their needs, understanding um, factor, risk and protective factors that may be unique to urban American Indian and Alaska Native life, and then interventions that are relevant given, again, a culturally diverse urban uh, Native context. And then the next slide. And so um, these should obviously, these are communities. They may not be have the same kinds of uh, political recognition as do federally or state recognized tribes, for example. And the processes for tribal review, approval, and engagement are going to differ. Um, and some of the organizations that you know, may be uh, relevant um, in tribal uh, urban settings would be urban Indian organizations, urban Indian health boards, urban Indian centers, and of course urban Indian community citizens themselves. So again, um, it's having those uh, same best practices and uh, place-based and community-driven uh, approaches to inquiry, but thinking about how those might apply in urban settings. So the next opportunity I wanted to talk about was, um, okay, let's see. So we should now be on the slide. Okay, oops. The title says Opportunities for Tribal Youth Research in Urban Settings, but it's actually, the, the content is about national and regional uh, settings. So um, anyway, um, so national and regional level data um, for tribal youth uh, can document strengths and needs that are common across Native youth regardless of their tri individual tribal backgrounds or community context. And these data that are national or regional in scope can support dialogues on critical issues of Native youth well-being related to health, education, and justice. Again, that may transcend geographic or tribal boundaries. And these kinds of national or regional uh, data can be a powerful collective voice in advocating for resources on a national or regional level again, to support strengths and address needs, for example, at a program or policy level. Those data can also be a point of comparison for individual tribal communities to determine the relative standing of their youth on any variety of, of outcomes, health, education, what have you. 
And these data that are, again, national or regional in scope are not a replacement to locally driven or contextualized data, but can offer a complement. So the next slide, again, this is about national and regional um, level data. Um, those data can be very hard to come by for anyone who's gone out looking for nationally representative data on tribal youth. A lot of times, uh, sample sizes in large national studies of American Indians and Alaska Natives are too small to report on separately if they're included at all. And so NCAI has a nice report titled The Asterisk Nation um, that I would refer people to um, for more information about that. And so again, using researchers' knowledge of community-based and tribal participatory approaches and best practices, there's an opportunity for researchers to be a part of translating those same kinds of processes. Again, they're going to look different, but how do you take that to a national or regional scale? So researchers can serve as PIs on study that studies that may be national or regional in scope. Um, they can serve as consultants um, to others doing that kind of work. And I'm going to describe a case example very briefly of an opportunity that I had to do exactly that. And funding agencies um, need to be mindful of the amount of resources, time, and money that it takes to do national or regional level work in the right way according to those best tribal practices. And tribal communities themselves, to the extent that they value being a part of national studies that aren't necessarily specific to or about their individual community, may need to give special consideration um, to the application of their research review policies, procedures, and practices, and, and how those may or may not fit a study that, again, is national or regional in scope. So very briefly, um, I'm on the slide. Um, that uh, presents an example of a community-based AIAN youth research on a national scale. So um, since 2013, I've been a member of the American Indian and Alaska Native Head Start Family and Child Experiences Survey, or AIAN FACES workgroup. That's the box there in the middle. Um, and uh, FACES, the Family and Child Experiences Survey, has been conducted every year since 1997. Um, in Head Start programs across the country, except for Head Start programs that are operated by um, federally recognized tribes. And that has a lot to do with some of the concerns that Dr. Um, Burnett was pointing out about historic mistrust of research in tribal communities. And, um, you know, we had an opportunity a couple of years ago to address um, the fact that tribal programs had not been included in any of the national studies of Head Start. So really briefly, um, the pie chart on the upper left just shows those are the to that's the total number of uh, American Indian Alaska Native children in Head Start nationwide. And that light blue, the smaller part of that pie chart, that carries over to the next pie chart. And those are the number, uh, are the percent, about less than half, almost half, but less than half of all American Indian and Alaska Native children in Head Start nationwide are attending those um, programs that are operated in Region 11. And Region 11 are those Head Start programs. There's about 154 of them operated by federally recognized tribes across the country. And that's that red map. They're operated in the lower 48 United States and Alaska. And again, their data, there had never been anything uh, about what was happening in that Region 11 um, uh, federally recognized tribes running Head Start. They had never been represented in any of the national studies on Head Start. So this work group came together and basically formed a community that was national in scope. And the picture there in the circle is just a picture of the, some of the individuals that were involved. And among those individuals were 13 Tribal Head Start directors who were uh, leaders in Tribal Head Start nationally. And they were really at the core of driving the study uh, design, um, you know, advising on how to engage with communities, tribal communities, in a way that was sensitive to um, tribal culture and tribal ways of knowing and ways of being. And they are also really critical as we now move to reporting 
on these data, um, what is reported, how it's reported and contextualized, and what are our priorities in terms of audiences. So that's just at a you know really a quick snapshot of some work that's taken place pretty intensively over the last few years. So thank you. I'm going to pass this on to uh, Dina around him. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelle. We appreciate the insight. And if we are going to pay attention to the realities facing children and families, we have to consider those living in urban contexts or moving between rural and urban contexts, as well as what's happening programmatically uh, within these national level programs. So thank you for those wonderful insights. We will now turn to Dina around him to share our last uh, presentation from one of our scholar partners. Dina? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Dina Aroundham, and I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I'm also a Collaborative Research Center for American Indian Health, or CURCA Fellow, at the Policy Research Center at NCAI. I've really enjoyed working with um, everyone who contributed to this document, and do want to acknowledge that um, a lot of what I'm presenting today is based on work that was presented at the initial um, NIHB post-conference session, um, which included presenters such as Catherine Burnett, Michelle Sarche, Dr. Teresa Brocky, who's at the National Institutes of Health. Um, Greg Tafoya gave comments, and um, Carolyn Hornbuckle has been really integral in um, planning that session and also um, working with us on this document. So next slide, please. So what I'm going to be focusing on today is um, kind of hopefully uh, solidifying a little bit of the, the themes that you've heard so far in the other presentations. Um, I'll present some possible ethical challenges and solutions that um, will be important for considering whenever you're doing work with American Indian Alaska Native youth related to the themes shown on the slide. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that, that this is not a comprehensive list or framework for thinking about ethical considerations when working with youth. Um, and also that it's not something that you should only engage with or think about at the beginning of a research study, that really it's something that you should check in with um, regularly throughout the research process. Um, we know that for decades, research has kind of been a taboo subject um, when thinking about research with tribal communities. But as you've heard today, um, I think in large part, tribal communities are really keenly aware of the value of research um, and the promise that it can hold. They simply want to be um, a part of that process and have it conducted in a way that's respectful of and beneficial for their individual citizens and communities. If we move on to the next slide, please. So on this slide, the first theme that we'll think about is confidentiality. Um, and I think that um, as many of you probably are aware, oftentimes when we're working with tribal communities, we're working in very small population contexts where everyone knows everyone. Um, so you can imagine that if you're focused on a, a research topic area that has some potential to stigmatize participants for the study, um, you really want to be aware of that, especially whenever you're working with youth. Um, thinking about where your research office is located and what kind, types of materials you might have um, either up on the wall or indicating what your office um, is for or what the study is about. Um, if your clinic office or your research office is based in the local clinic um, where everyone can see who's going in and out of that study office, that's something that you would want to be aware of. You would also want to think about particular methodologies. Um, focus groups are often turned to as a methodology that um, sort of resonates well with tribal communities, um, but if the topic area is something that could raise some um, stigmatizing conversation or require participants to feel like they may have to disclose their personal beliefs or um, attitudes about something that would um, be harmful to them in the long run, they may be less um, likely to fully engage in that methodology. So you want to have those considerations in the back of your mind. Um, it's also important to think about unintended consequences of community confidentiality. There are very valid reasons for maintaining confidentiality of tribal communities if that's what they prefer. Um, however, you would want to engage in a discussion with your tribal partners um, and local experts to understand how maintaining community confidentiality might potentially limit your ability to advocate for future resources related to that topic area. Um, may limit your ability to understand intertribal differences related to that topic, 
and perhaps um, limit your ability to acknowledge tribal partners um, in naming organizations or even including um, your tribal partners as co-authors on publications. So, some ways to work around um, some of these issues are to utilize community-involved or participatory research methodologies so that you can work through them and address them up front. And as many of the speakers have already stated, to really engage youth in the research process throughout, from um, development of the research questions to designing the methodology that you'll use and disseminating and messaging the information around that study. Next slide. So another area that you might want to consider in doing research with tribal youth is the area of consent. Um, challenge related to consent might arise from the fact that in many of our tribal communities, kinship and extended family care situations are very common. Um, so you may need to think through your study protocol and process for handling situations where perhaps guardianship has not been established legally. Um, there might also be settings where children are living with a parental figure um, that they view as their true mother or father figure or other biological relative when that um, biological uh, relationship isn't truly what they believe. So for example, um, they may have a father figure who's not biologically related at all, or they may live with a um, person that they view as their mother who's actually a biologically an aunt. So you would want to think through those aspects of your work and decide whether or not um, you're comfortable with letting children participate if guardianship has not been established legally. And also, if you have any kind of genetic research going on in your studies, you would want to think um, very carefully about those biological relationships and the potential to have to disclose um, genetic information to related family members and what that might look like. Age of consent is also a concern that you would want to think through carefully. Um, this could involve um, lowering uh, age of consent. For example, if you're engaged in maternal and child health study in a population where early childbearing is very common, um, a tribe might actually request that you lower age of consent so that they can actually um, get people into the study um, who would actually help create more valid research results. Um, there may also be considerations around um, certain developmental stages in certain tribal communities where they would want to change the age of consent or assent um, depending on those cultural belief systems. So again, um, input from your local community is the best way to think about um, addressing some of these challenges. Um, your tribal research oversight body, if one exists, like a research review board or IRB institutional review board, would be a great place to get um, information on that, if, especially if they've um, managed protocols that include some of these issues or that they've dealt with before. You might, might also want to consider using a community advisory board or a youth advisory board. Next slide. Um, the next uh, topic area is referral context. So um, many of the outcomes that we might be interested in looking at with tribal youth likely occur because there is a lack of um, resources or services in the area. Um, so there may be situations where you're engaged in a research study and you identify um, service needs related to mental health, substance abuse, or child abuse and neglect. Um, there could be times where the focus of your study is on something clinical and you have a great referral process um, set up for referring for clinical services, um, but a mental health or substance use issue arises and so you need to have a plan for thinking about some of that. Um, again, if this is in a limited resource setting, that can be really challenging because there may be nowhere to refer to. Um, so leveraging your own personal networks um, to bring in new resources might be important, and working with local officials to identify existing resources will also um, be really beneficial. Again, CBPR um, is a great way to do that. Also, if you can provide something back to the community, if you're documenting these issues, um, they may have no capacity for um, creating data or maintaining data on these issues themselves. So if you're able to provide that data back to the community, that could be an added benefit. Um, and last, even though you provide a referral, that may not result in receipt of services. So it's always great to provide an on-site, culturally appropriate debrief mechanism, such as smudging or something else that participants could um, access if they're interested. 
And it's also great to provide these for study staff as well because they may be hearing a lot of difficult information um, that they need to process so that they can continue to do their work. Next slide. The next topic area is related to law and jurisdiction. Um, there could be differences in tribal and state laws for reporting um, and mandatory reporting around issues like child abuse and neglect, use of substances um, in pregnancy, or minor alcohol or substance use. So you'd want to really understand what those differences might be, um, and again, access your local experts for identifying those differences to understand what you're expected to uphold in your research process. It can also be difficult to determine who to approach for approvals in research in these different settings. Um, sometimes you're working with a local, uh, locally controlled IRB or RRB. Other times you're working with a regional or national or some sort of institutional IRB, like a university IRB. Um, so ask questions. Don't shy away from these issues. Um, it's important to know and think through these processes up front. And things like um, resolutions, laws, or memorandums of agreements um, that you can work out with your tribal partners can really help in guiding this work. Next slide. So I'll move through the next two sections um, relatively quickly so we can get on to some discussion. Um, this slide talks about study design. Um, in certain communities, there may be some reluctance to utilize certain study designs, um, for example, observational studies or studies that utilize a standard of care or placebo control group. Um, and this is often because communities have very low resources and they want to make sure their tribal members who are participating in research are getting something, getting some sort of benefit out of it. Um, this can have some implications for the cost of the study and the demands on your, your study staff or personnel if they're um, required to um, understand a completely separate um, protocol or intervention um, aside from what you're already testing. So you want to really think through um, some strategies for utilizing innovative study designs and really think about whether or not it's defensible to use some of these designs um, if there is a real um, need in the area. Um, again, the possible solutions, um, there's room for innovation in your study design, and you could um, work out some ways to train researchers on new methodologies and also train your tribal partners around basics of research and why certain mechanisms are, or study designs are important. Um, last, I wanted to talk about sustainability on the next slide. And here, um, just to point out that assurance about sustainability is often desired by both communities and funders. Um, funders want to know that the dollars they're putting in are useful and communities want the same. Um, and this can be really challenging when the resources or human capital is limited in an area. And you really want to think about what your obligation is as a researcher. And as we've heard, um, it's really easy to think about building capacity through engaging youth um, in the research process and building up their skills and knowledge along the way. Um, you need to acknowledge these limitations up front, and there are ways to sort of step out of your academic researcher box to make sure that resources are getting back to the community to provide that added benefit. So the last slide I have, um, in summary, um, family relationship structures and guardianship may be important to consider in the consent or assent process. Um, it's a uh, priority community needs and trends have to inform the research. And it's very essential um, to research tribal and state requirements around mandatory reporting and make sure you have a plan in place to debrief participants um, and also your study staff. And last, um, researchers should consider the advocacy nature of their work and the impact of the narratives that they're developing as they engage in it. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Dean. I think really emphasizing the pieces about uh, developing your, your orientation as a researcher, your sense of responsibility, but also getting under um, some of what we hear a lot in this context about, um, you know, it's important to develop appropriate and meaningful research. Well, what goes into that? What are some of these elements that you must consider in developing right relationship and, uh, and really engaging with community protocols um, so that it is appropriate and, and beneficial on the back end? So thank you for that great presentation. So we have uh, about 
15, 20 minutes here to finish out our 90 minute session and we've uh, brainstormed a few discussion questions. If you um, raise your hand, we can either take you off mute or if you want to type in your question into the interface box, we can have Sarah um, read them out. But some of the discussion questions that we developed, and I apologize for um, when I've got a missing word here on the first bullet, should say, what did you hear uh, that resonates with your work? Second uh, potential question is, what is missing and should be added? Are there other major themes that uh, you find are important that you'd like us to add in? Can this tool be useful in your work? How do you see using this? And then open-ended uh, question about whether you have any questions that you'd like to put to our presenters uh, or others on the phone here. So uh, Sarah, if you received any questions um, thus far? We do have one question. Uh, the question is specifically about uh, if there could be a little more discussion on how tribal colleges or universities and health clinics acquire tribal community approvals, um, how they are reached when in, um, in local, when there is research in local cities with many tribes. So the question is about um, what percentage of, okay, so the curious about how many percentage of tribes have their own IRBs. Great. All right, well, I'll go ahead and jump in there and then invite our presenters to, who, who want to perhaps add and to say I think there's a couple of, of points in there. One may be about um, the kind of the, the number of tribes that have their own oversight um, processes, codes, tribal research codes, things of that sort, and, and how to maybe manage um, research across multiple sites. Uh, was that yeah, also in there? Sorry for conflating those two questions. So the first is about how do you kind of do multi-tribe research when you're dealing within one city, for example, or township, something of that sort. And then, so how do you broker approval processes in that context? And then the secondary sure. was about just kind of um, how many IRBs do we know of nationally? Sure. So I can answer that latter one. I know that IHS, the Indian Health Service, uh, probably maintains one of the most up-to-date lists um, of tribal IRBs uh, that are that have uh, federal insurance or that have gone through um, a more typical process that we might uh, expect. And so I would point you to their website. Uh, Mose Hearn maintains that. And I believe uh, that last count there were between 12 and maybe um, 20 uh, tribal IRBs that they've noted. I know that University of Arizona also maintained a list um, over time. Um, so I would say there's about that, but that's in, at the individual tribal level. Uh, others may not have uh, formal, what we might consider formal IRBs, but may have research review uh, boards. And I know Dr. Dina is involved with, um, as are we, the um, Collaborative Research Center for American Indian Health that's working on um, supporting tribes in the Great Plains region to develop theirs. There are also intertribal uh, bodies such as the um, Rocky Mountain uh, Tribal Leaders um, Council up in the Montana-Wyoming region, and they um, uh, provide uh, oversight to research that's happening with more than uh, one tribe in their region. They are a tribal body, um, and there are others that support uh, and are in support partnered uh, work to provide tribal oversight such that if a tribal research proposal um, comes up in the region, uh, universities might partner and um, provide an opportunity for our tribal leaders to serve on an existing IRB to monitor and manage that. So there's a number of different um, kind of arrangements and models out there um, to ensure uh, tribal oversight. Um, I would also say that there we've been tracking some efforts uh, specifically there in Arizona. The regents recently um, released their, what we're seeing is one of the first tribal consultation policies for a university system and trying to understand uh, what that's going to mean. But really, the importance of creating a culture um, at, a, at a research institution for respecting um, the value of tribal consultation and tribal oversight in research is a critical first step in um, acknowledging and encouraging and supporting researchers to um, work with tribes in terms of a government-to-government uh, -government relationship and a governance oversight role. So there's a few that we're monitoring on that front. Um, are there other? Comments from the panelists um, in relation to that question? 
Um, this is Michelle. Um, I'm not really sure how to guide on the question for um, like in an urban setting and um, what that means for official tribal review. Say um, there's a citizen of a particular nation living in, a, in an urban area. I think um, different tribal research review entities have different, um, you know, um, policies, if you will, about whether or not, say, a citizen of um, the Cherokee Nation living in um, New York City, um, I don't, they may have different, I'm not saying that the Cherokee Nation IRB does or doesn't have this policy, it was just an example of a tribal citizen in an urban setting, but I think there are some tribal review entities that may um, claim that they would ha um, have to review any studies that their citizens would be involved in where, wherever they may reside. Um, but I'm not sure how practical that is, um, you know, from either the tribal review board side or the researchers side. And I would be curious to hear other panelists um, understanding of, of that and how to respond to that question. This is Dina around him and I, I think that's kind of exactly um, the challenge, especially related to the content that um, Dr. Sarche was presenting. Um, we're kind of in this place and, and juxtaposed with the information that Dr. Yazimant presented. We're in this place where um, local research review, local tribal review has really started started to take off and there's a real value in doing um, small-scale community-based uh, research. However, at the same time we have research growing at the national level um, and we're really just starting to understand um, where some of the challenges might come into play with um, uh, how our tribal research review policies exist currently. Um, some tribes choose to set up their review policies um, with regard to uh, geography or their jurisdictional area um, pertaining to their tribal lands, while others choose to set it up um, in a way that uh, is structured around their tribal citizens wherever they may be. So um, I think the question is kind of an open question of how that will shake out and what that means for um, doing research at a more um, broad or regional or national level. So stay tuned. <laughs> right, right. The case example that I presented of the um, national study with Head, of Head Start, that happened in 21, um, randomly selected from those 154 tribal grantees, um, tribal communities, and um, I, we went through the tribal review um, policies in each of those 21 communities, and um, you know, some there was uh, negotiation along the way because I think models that um, pertain to research happening in a specific, you know, jurisdictionally defined, geographically defined, federally recognized tribe, let's say, um, those policies and procedures don't always map on to um, other models for research. So in this case, the study was not about any one of those tribal communities, and the data will never be reported on at a tribal community level. Let's just be reported on as across all of those communities. Um, and so um, there were discussions and negotiations, I guess you'd say, on all sides um, to come to agreements that were both practical and feasible on the research side, but also um, felt acceptable um, on the tribe side with all those sensitivities around tribal ownership of data and um, that kind of thing. And I would just add, just to re, uh, you know, affirm what you're saying. I mean, I think at NCI, we certainly take the position that tribes have sovereignty over research that's conducted on their lands or with their citizens, even when their citizens aren't on their lands. But where this comes in in terms of applied is 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 the goals of protect and benefit through research. And so, at the very least, you know, if it, if it is you know challenging. 
um, to really identify who are the deciders, for instance, in some of the urban kind of um, inner tribal work that's happening and, and providing that appropriate oversight at the very least. If you are going to report at a tribal level um, some of the data really needing to go through that process to, to ensure there is protection and um, you know prevent any stigmatization or, or any undue harm at that level. But you know the more that you can involve tribal or the community um, uh, stewards of the information, the more benefit can be can be offered, I think, at a at a more local level. So trying to find that important balance between protect and benefit um, in, in the approvals and, and stewardship conversation. So. We have one of our participants sharing that in an urban setting, they, they feel that one thing that would be of use is using community advisory councils to review some of these documents and procedures as well as just be informed about IRBs and what their roles can be in, in thinking about participating in research. So that was just a comment shared. Um, there was also another question raised about how this might apply over international borders um, when you're working with tribes. Um, you know, from my own experience, I worked and uh, did a kind of a comparative case study between the Blackfoot tribe, uh, you know, nation in Canada, and the Blackfeet, their neighbors to the south in Montana, and, you know, just kind of thinking about um, when you have similar groups and how do you kind of broker some of the considerations and consent processes there. Absolutely, and I, I think I would just add just this notion about place and, and thinking about borders and, and how place still connects people, group, groups of youth and families, how they may experience those places in particular ways and the responsibilities to steward decision making and research um, across those I think would be would be similar. It's, it's really about making sure that there's those protections and those benefits um, you know, in light of the places that people are moving across certainly comes up in terms of the mobility that I know uh, several of our presenters talked about today. Exactly. And in the case that I shared, you know, that was one where um, certainly both of the governments were consulted, decision-making authorities, and, and um, as one of the other participants shared, um, one of the members of our PRC Advisory Council, in fact, um, they said that there should be a process with a definite follow-up date so that um, the, res you know, the re findings and data and everything is disseminated out to the community and shared if, if it's a scenario where the community themselves aren't actively engaged in the, in the co data collection and analysis process. And she said that um, uh, it's, it's important to stick to that date and be good on your promises. This has to be step one in planning and not an afterthought. These are one of the reasons tribes do not find partnerships useful in research contexts. When researchers grab the cheese and run like a rat, don't be a rat, she said. <laughs> so just wanted to share that. Absolutely, echoing that benefit back and, and the fact that, you know, so many of us get into this work so that there are, you know, meaningful value add that we're, we're offering to those that we are in partnership with. So that's great. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity to go to our, our last slide here, which is just to give you a few cents, a uh, little bit of a sense of our next steps with this. I mentioned that we are planning to um, share the tips for researchers. If you click to the next slide there for us, Sarah. Um, the tips for researchers document that we've been presenting on and, and helping to, to shape at NCAI's uh, annual convention in Phoenix uh, in the second week of October. We'll have that available on our website as well, and we'll work with the list that we have um, generated from this webinar to make sure to send it out to all of you. Um, and we'll be sending out the link to this uh, webinar in case there are others um, who are not available at this time or not able to get on for whatever reason, um, so that you can share the link if they'd like to um, watch and hear some of what we presented today. I really want to thank our uh, presenters very much for all of their time and commitment uh, to making sure that there is meaningful value um, added to our Native youth and families um, and the communities that they work within and live within um, as part of this resource. Also, if others of you have um, information on some resources that you'd like for us to include, 
we will have a, um, a resource guide that we'll be adding to um, uh, as part of this Tips for Researchers document. So please do send through any information or resources that you'd like for others to be made aware of. And we'll do our best to synthesize that and add to that over time. Um, also, if those of you are on the phone or know of others who have uh, cases, case studies, we're going to be developing a series of case studies, um, both in kind of text-based and video form, um, to continue to add to this, uh, this guide. And we have a few that we've been collecting, and you heard a little bit about. There are four or five cases um, presented in the, in the guide, um, but we'd love to add more. So if you have others that you'd like to put us in touch with, ways that we can develop tools abstracted so it doesn't have to be named in terms of the community or the, or the researcher, but just to give people some examples of best practice and uh, information that would be helpful in improving the field. Um, that would be really appreciated. So thank you all so much for your time and uh, really look forward to seeing some of you at our annual convention in Phoenix and to connecting uh, in this work to help support and celebrate our Native youth and families. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.